but I want to pick up uh, today. Last week we had a phenomenal service, and uh, the Holy Spirit just kind of orchestrated things as He saw fit. And you know, one thing that uh, is always an indicator of doing the right thing when you listen to the Holy Spirit is the testimonies that come out of that. You know, it's I, I, I'm thankful that we are not a church that is nailed and stapled down to what we, an agenda and what we've said, okay, this has to happen today. Last week, the Spirit of God started moving, and, you know, we've had testimonies, even as of this morning, people coming up to us saying, my back was healed, uh, I, I had nerve problems in my back, I haven't had a pain in a week. We had people that have put down cigarettes and got free from tobacco addictions, haven't smoked in a week, and just that no cravings. I mean, it's, listen, when the Holy Spirit shows up, He can do more in 15 minutes than we can do in 15 years. And I, I love the fact that God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so I want to just ask you that question. Is there anything this morning that, that you need God to do for you that it's outside of your realm of possibility and power? Is there anybody that you're not too proud to raise your hand and say, hey, I need God to do something for me right now that I can't do by myself? I ain't talking about praying about where you're going to go eat after church. I'm talking about you need God to do something for you or for your family. You need God to do something in your job. You need God to do something in your body. You need God to do something that you're not, if, if he doesn't show up, then you, you're not, you're not going to get there. It's a, <laughs> it's a tough place to be. But he's a faithful God. So I'm going to spring back to week before last and do just a short recap uh, and I'm going to kind of fill in where, where we left off a couple weeks ago, even where we, we concluded last week. But I, I really feel like it's important for us to grasp some concepts that the Word of God has for us today. Um, so if you have your Bibles, uh, I'll tell you what, just hold on to them for a second. I'm, a, I'm just going to recap, and then uh, I'll, I'll let you know. You can turn to Genesis chapter 1 uh, and just hold it there, but I'm going to read some passages before that. Um, so... If they put Romans chapter 10 in verse 8 through 10, uh, and it may sound like I'm just a tad bit repetitive over the last week or so, but I really feel like we need to, we need to solidify this foundation. Romans chapter 10 in verses 8 through 10, uh, I'll be reading in the New King James Version, and um, if you would just follow along with me. <clears throat> Excuse me, I done passed it up. I had it marked and still passed it up. Verse 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith. Everybody say the word of faith. The word of faith, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that the Lord God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. There it is. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. I had, a, I had a young man one time challenge the fact that we prayed with people for them to receive their salvation. And he challenged me and he said, I don't think that you can just repeat a prayer and be saved. And I said, I will slightly agree. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, I do believe that you can have empty words, meaningless words. I believe that. I said, but I'm also not one to judge if a person confesses, I cannot visibly see whether they truly believe in their heart. But I can point them to the scripture. And what his problem was is he, I really think once we, once we drilled down into it, and he ended up leaving the church and going into Orthodox Christianity. And I, I'm, I'm not slamming that whatsoever, but w as we begin to drill down into the issue of the conversation, I soon figured out that it was just that he could not wrap his mind around the simplicity that if one confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart, this almighty God would complete the work that his son did on Calvary in them. He was seeing it as a thing, okay, I've got to do these works, I've got to, I've got to perform, I've got to live up to, I've got... 
Can I just tell you, how many of y'all thankful that we don't have to perform or live up to the standard of righteousness, but all we got to do is believe that he is going to become our sin and that we become the righteousness of God. And we do it by grace through faith. That's the staple of our beliefs. And so it was, it was interesting to have this conversation. And, you know, we, just, we, we had to agree to disagree and we didn't see things the same way, but... Moving down in verse 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, familiar passage. So then faith comes by what? And hearing by the word of God. Hearing the word of God produces faith in our hearts. Hearing the word of God is what opens the door for someone to place their faith in Jesus as their savior. That's what this passage is talking about. How can someone be saved unless somebody goes and tells them? How can somebody go and tell them unless they've been sent? So we have a commission, y'all. There's people that we are sent to every day that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul is asking us the question in this passage, saying, how can they believe unless they hear? I'm asking you right now. If you've ever complained that you work in hell, have you ever stopped and thought that you might be the one to open up heaven to them? If you, ever, if you live in a family that's, that's full of hell and you say, this is hell to be in this family, have you ever thought that God might have planted you there as a conduit or as a door to be able to speak so they would hear and so faith could come in? You say, well, I live in a world of darkness. What's his word say? It says the entrance of thy word brings light. I think we underestimate sometimes just what simple words of the gospel spoken into situations and to families I think we underestimate our ability to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I just go ahead and tell you, you ain't got to be perfect and all put together. and You don't have to be behind a pulpit to tell somebody about Jesus. In fact, I think God loves to use messed up people to tell other messed up people about Jesus. And if you say, well, I feel like a hypocrite. You know what? We're all hypocrites in some way or form. We're, we're all that way in some shape or another. We're all hypocritical to a degree. If anything, it just further proves God's grace that he's willing to use imperfect people to relay a perfect message. That, that's encouragement to me. I don't, let, I don't let my failures discourage me, my past mistakes discourage me from doing what I know God has called me to do. Why? Because he empowers me, he enables me. It's not in my own power of righteousness that I'm standing here. It's in him. So don't ever let anything, anything, anybody hold you back from telling somebody the goodness of God. Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews 11 being the faith chapter. I'm sorry, I said chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, just to reiterate this, this scripture, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That substance was the foundation. I know it sounds repetitive, but I, I just needed to go there. The substance is the foundation is what stands under the evidence that proves that what we cannot see is there. How many of y'all are believing for something in faith that you're not looking at yet? The Bible says you can't hope for anything that you already have. So there's things that we cannot see that we have not laid hold to, but by faith we know that we will see them. So where I want to start moving into today is where do our words match up with our faith? Are we saying we believe one thing, but we're confessing and speaking the realities of another? The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus put it plainly and said, those, those, he said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I wonder how many times we virtue signal by our words, but we do not actually live out what we say. 
going back to the emptiness of words, it's possible to say Christian slogans and cliche sayings but not walk the walk. It's possible to talk the talk but not walk the walk because walking the walk is a lot harder than talking the talk. Talking doesn't cost much. But walking out what you talk, that costs something. And so what I'm asking us today is, is what are we seeing in our life? What is the result of our words and our faith? Are we speaking words? Are we saying we believe something but we really don't believe? Jesus said, if you will speak to this mountain, if you'll say to this mountain, and what? Doubt not in your heart. In the book of James, it talks about not being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. It says that if you ask without doubt, you'll have. So sometimes, I, you know, I, I know that we can ask amiss or we can ask outside of God's will, but sometimes I think that we ask or we say or we believe or we speak things, but we really don't believe that he can do it. Come on, I, look. This is going to get tight in here today. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you all that. How often do we say, oh, God, I believe you can. But deep down, we have our contingency plan of if he doesn't. Oh, I'm going to say it again. How often we say, God, I know you will. But just in case you don't. Now, granted, I'm not talking, I'm not saying that you should be foolish. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be wise with money and with resources and with family. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't work and that you shouldn't save or, or you shouldn't invest or build. I'm not saying any of that. But there are some things that outside. See, everything, we always put, for some reason, we always context, context money in this. Let, 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 let's get outside the thought of money. Get outside the, the, the financial box right now. We ain't talking about money. Because there's some things that we need God to do for us that money cannot buy. You can't buy a different diagnosis from a doctor. You can't pay a doctor. You can might pay him to lie to you. But I'm talking about something that you can't buy, something you can't put a price on, but something that he's already put a price on. What happens when we say, God, I trust you to do this, but just in case you don't, I'm going to have this, and can I tell you something? Your plan will never produce anything of promise as it pertains to the kingdom. The Bible talks about that they hewn cisterns for themselves. It says that they, they forsook God, and they, they made for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that could not hold water, and they forsook the very source of living water. There's nothing that we can do in our human power, wisdom, or intelligence to... to replicate to duplicate or to replace what God can do for us y'all with me so we got Hebrews chapter 1 and uh, chapter 11 verse 1 through 3 if we'll put this up I want to read the last part of that scripture put Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 through 3 by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible Look at, look at this scripture. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. This word framed in Hebrew is the same word in, that it uses in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21 where it says that the disciples were mending their nets. It uses the same word. That's interesting to me. If you, if you ever start just looking at all the different Hebrew words, so the same word that pops up in Matthew chapter 4 where the disciples are mending their nets right before Jesus tells them to throw on the other side is the same verbiage that's used in Hebrews 11 talking about he framed the world, which is referring back to Genesis chapter 1. Interesting to me. Let's look at what the word, the etymology, the meaning is actually, it's to arrange, to set in order, to equip, to complete what is lacking, to repair or to prepare. With his words, all you got to do is read Genesis chapter 1, if they'll put that on the screen, let's read that. Genesis chapter 1, with his words, God began to frame the world. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God, what? Come on, y'all participate with me. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. It keeps going. God just keeps saying, and God said, and God said, and God said. And every time he spoke, he began to structure a little more and frame a little more the world. In other words, with his words, he began to put structure and order into chaos. Can I tell you that the word of God still does that for lives today? With his word. This right here. You could be formless and void. Chaos. But with his word, he can begin to structure and frame you so that he can fill you. You look at Genesis chapter 1. He structured and framed the world. Then he filled it. Is that not what it says? So it's to arrange, to set in order, to equip, to complete what is lacking. He framed it, then he filled it. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. This is where I'm really shifting into the, 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 the message today. Genesis 1 chapter, chapter 1 verse 26. It says, then, let, then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him male and female. There's a revelation for a lot of people. Two. Male and female. No confusion. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He gave Adam and Eve dominion. It goes on later and says that whatever, God brought all the animals in front of Adam and it said whatever he called them, that's what their name was. Now just go with me for a second. When God says, let us make man in our own image, he said in our image and our likeness. Those two words, although they kind of look like they're the same, they're two totally different words. One is talking about the outline and the structure. The other is talking about the substance or what is on the inside. This trips a lot of people up, but I believe that in the beginning, I believe that Adam and Eve were able to speak to things. It wasn't until after the curse, after the fall, until they had to begin to toil in the soil, right? Right? I believe that things happen by speaking. That's just me. You might can argue with me on that, but there's a lot of evidence to prove to it. Could it be that because we are made in God's image, even though we can't speak and create our own physical world, well, kind of, kind of about to go against myself here. We may not be God, but could it be that because we're made in his likeness and our image, that our words have power to create let me, let me, let me just, let me, y'all, y'all, y- hear me out before you write me off, all right? Maybe you've never given thought to this. I, maybe you have. Could it be that our words very well frame and prepare the world that we live in? Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, To guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the, the issues of life. You don't believe your words have power? Let's talk about it for a second. All you that are married in here. (laughs) You don't think your words matter? Throw some words at your wife or your husband that aren't full of love. You don't think your words matter? Guys, have you ever been asked, how do I look in this dress? Your words will fashion the world that you live in from that point forward. Those words will create the world that you're about to ride in the car with. I'm not condoning lie. 
But you better pray for wisdom in those moments, fellas. Like, do some double speak or something. How does this dress make me look? Babe, I can't even, I don't, the words fail me. I don't even know how to describe <laughs> what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> Let's flip it a little bit. Y'all ever cook something? How does this taste? Have you ever been so honest to say it's terrible? That is a, that is that actually is a fun part of the when you get to that point in marriage where you're like, me and Lauren was cooking not too long ago and I, I don't know something made something and I was like this is horrible. She cooked something up and I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> it's like I'm going to Linda's fried chicken. I'll be back in a minute. But if you don't think your words have power, throw some words out there and see what happens. Is there anybody that you've seen the words coming out of your mouth change somebody's smile, change their day? I, look, I make it a point to live. I, I make it a point to live intentionally with my words. If I'm at a restaurant and I see a young person, a, a young man or young woman having a hard time waiting tables, I'm not going to be the jerk. I'll never forget, we sat down at a restaurant one time, and there's this young lady comes up, and you could just tell she was working. And I, I just looked at her, I said, how's, I said, how's everybody treating you today? And that poor baby's lips started quivering. And she sat there and started crying. And she started telling us about the table that was before her that was just mean. And, and y'all understand what I'm saying? I've told people in checkout lines. I hope you have a great day. You ever told somebody God loves them and watch a smile break out on their face? That, y'all, that doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to be nice. But your words have power. I'm telling you, look, uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a little jiu-jitsu tournament that Maddox wanted to do. He asked me to do it. He said, Dad, can I compete in this tournament? I said, sure, buddy, we'll sign you up. So we signed him up. We pay his registration fee. He gets there. I knew it was going to be a decent-sized tournament. And he, he had a bunch of close matches for, you know, his last couple of tournaments. He fought really hard. He did really well. But, he, I mean, he barely, barely got squeaked out. And uh, so coming up into this tournament, he asked to do it. And then about, not about three or four days out of the tournament, he tells his mom. He didn't tell me this. He didn't tell me this. He tells his mom. He says, uh, he says Mom, I'm probably only going to get silver or bronze. And she said, why? Why do you think that? He said, because that's, uh, that's all I've ever gotten. And, and so Lauren told me that. And so I knew what I had to do as a dad at that point. And it was, it was somewhat of, a, at first I, I, I sat him down, and I sat down in front of him. I said, hey, bud, I said, we need to talk about this. I said, first of all, we've already paid your registration fee for this tournament. I said, but mom told me that you, you told her that you, you're probably only going to get silver or bronze. And he's like, well, I said, okay, here's the deal. If you're not going to think that you can go in there and get gold, we're going to forfeit the 40 bucks, and we're not even going to this tournament. We're not even, even going to go. If you're telling me that you think you're already going to lose, we're not even going to go. And he goes, well, I want to go. I said, all right, well, you've got to change your thoughts, man. And I, listen, so I sat in front of him, and I said, dude, you are as good, if not better, than every little kid in there that's your size and your age. I said, there ain't a person in there on your best day that can beat you at the rank you're at right now. And I began to put in him some confidence. I said, we're not going there unless you tell me that you know you can get gold. And I just began to pump words into him. And he, he said, okay, Dad, I can do it. And then we get there. And he starts competing, and I don't remember how many matches he had, but he won his first couple, and he had a few more. And, you know, and then and finally, I, I was, was kind of watching the bracket, and I was like, okay, he's got a real good chance of winning this. And finally, he fought his last match, and I realized he had secured it. And I, I went back to Lauren, and I was like, he got gold. But in the middle of that, he had like a couple more matches to go. And I t he, he, he finished one, and I come, I said, come get you some water, man. He was catching his breath. And I was patting him on the back. I said, dude, you are doing so awesome. I said, I'm so proud of you. No matter what happens next, I said, I'm super proud of the way that you're competing right now. And he, he turns and he goes, Dad, I'm just thinking about the gold. <laughs> and look, I, <laughs> I, I almost teared up. I was like, you keep thinking about it, dude. 
I was like, when you fist bump that guy, I was like, just think, don't even look at his face. Just see a gold medal and just annihilate it. <laughs> and he ended up winning, and he was so proud. But you know, here's the deal. I'm not some super power, but my words in his ear, it literally framed a place for confidence to be built. My words built confidence in his little spirit that empowered him to do in the physical. Can I tell you that in the same way we have a father, that when we look at all of the odds and even when we look at our past records and we say, I don't think I can do this, Dad. I don't think I can do this, God. I don't. We have a father that wants to whisper and speak words of encouragement and frame a place for his, your confidence to be built up and trust and faith in him. You have a father that is looking at you saying, no, you can do this. Why? Because you're more than a conqueror. You are more than a winner. You've already won. How many times, though, do we look at the possibilities of our future based off of the realities of our past? We're, we're, we're real bad about doing that. So, parents, if you don't think that your words have power... You're sorely mistaken. And can I, just, uh, can I just step out to the side right now and say, parents, you need to watch the words you speak over your kids. Because your words are sowing seeds in them. Listen, I come in contact with people all the time that say stupid things to me. And do you know what combats the stupidity? The wisdom that has been spoken into my ear. See, I don't have to, I don't have to listen what people, what somebody is saying about me if I know what's inside of me. You can come tell me. You can come talk about me. You can come, you can come accuse me. But if I know the truth, it's, it's not going to settle. Parents, it's very important that you're putting words inside your children. That when other forces, other words try to come in, there's something that rises up in them and fights off what something else is trying to label them as. Because this society that we live in, young parents, listen to me. Listen to me right now. If you're not speaking words of affirmation and identity into them, there's a society waiting to put an identity. They're waiting to put a label. And it ain't got nothing to do with the spirit of God or righteousness. I had a friend of mine tell me not too long ago, he had a 13-year-old daughter. And his daughter come to him and told him, said, Dad, I think I'm, I think I'm gay. He said, why would you think that? And he said, she said, because I've never had a boyfriend. He said, you're 13. He said, no, I, I want to know who told you that. Well, what, it, what it amounted to is that some kids at school, because this little girl had never had a, a boyfriend, said, well, oh, well, you must be this. And so she brought that question home. But if there had not been a parent to say, no, you're not this, you're just 13 and you don't have a boyfriend. Stop with all that stupid junk. But if you're not putting anything in your kids to help them recognize a lie, and the only thing that points out a lie is the truth. You need to be putting something in your kids, words. If you look at your kid and say, what, are you stupid or something? Guess what they're going to begin to personify? It's never too late to begin to speak life. I, look, I, I, I was raised up in an advantageous position because I was always told, no, you can do this. No, you can do this. I, 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 and I don't, I'm not saying this because they're sitting right there. I'm saying this because I was blessed with parents that affirmed us, reassured us, put words of confidence in us. And there's been times that in, in, in places of doubt, in places of worry, that I have reached back and grabbed words. One of my friends, Tony Hooper, lives in, uh, in Mississippi. We, we've gone on a couple mission trips together. We were on our way to Bulgaria one time, and he and I were talking. And he said, you know, he said years ago, I came to a service, he said, and your grandpa, he said, your grandpa called me down, he said, and he began to prophesy over me. He said, and I was just a young man. He said, and your grandpa looked at me, and he said, he yelled at me. He said, rise up, man of God. And he said, he told him again, he said, rise up. And Tony said, years later, he said, I was in one of the lowest 
places of my life where he wanted his life to end. He said, and I'm telling you as clear as clear can be, he said, I heard the words of your grandfather at the altar telling me to rise up. He said, and it was those words that enabled me to get up, pick myself up, and realize that I had better days ahead. You never know what a word under the inspiration and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit can do for somebody in due season, in the right time. That's why it's always important to be speaking words of life, words of power. But we have the ability to frame our world with our words. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. I read this this scripture last week. It says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Wow. Verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You're telling me that I can speak to something and determine whether it lives or dies? Yes. Yes. You might be sitting out there saying, well, I don't have that kind of power. Okay? I've never met anybody that's been struggling in a marriage that continues to speak negativity to it and actually make it through. But I've seen people speak the words of God. I've seen people sow the words of God and watch the power of that begin to appear and to work for them. There was a time in my life where I needed to forgive, and I needed to forgive greatly. My my freedom, my call, my life was literally hanging in the balance of my ability to forgive people. And I I even told Dad, I said, I just don't think I can do it. And you know what he told me? This was his advice. Son, he said, you just begin to say, I forgive, I forgive. I forgive until what you say becomes what you're thinking and what you're thinking becomes what you are. And listen, at first it felt like empty words, but I continue to confess, God, with your, with your help, I'm going to forgive. I forgive them. I forgive this. I forgive myself. And I'm telling you, forgiveness found its way into my life and it set me free. But it took some speaking. It took confessing. But here's the thing. You say, oh, it's more than that. You actually got to take action. Yeah, but I had to speak words before I saw action. I know there might be some of you hanging up with this whole concept. But I'm telling you, sometimes we got to talk ourselves into a better place. And you say, well, it takes more than that. I won't Read Genesis chapter 1. And God said. And God said. And God said. I don't like to be around negative people. I don't like to ride in the car with negative people. I had somebody get in my vehicle one time and they're like, be my luck, we won't even make it there. Get out of my truck. (laughs) Find you a ride, sucker. (laughs) Getting ready to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. One of my friends, he's like, man, what if this sucker goes down in the middle of the ocean? I said, it ain't. <laughs> How you know? I said, I got unfulfilled words of prophecy. <laughs> Y'all, you think I'm joking? I said, no, there's still things that God's told me is going to happen that I ain't seen happen yet. Right. I said, there's still a church to pastor that I ain't stepped into. I said, there's still kids to raise that I ain't finished raising yet. I said, there's still promises that God has said is going to happen, and it ain't come to pass yet. So that tells me that until I see them, this whole deal right here ain't going to happen. Can I tell you something? This is the power of God's word. I remember talking to Brother Larry one time. I remember talking to Brother Larry, and I don't, you may remember this conversation. You may not, but I, I was struggling with a spirit of fear and torment in my life. This is after I was saved, y'all, but I was struggling with with. Just the devil speaking lies to me, talking about, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And, I'm, and I, conf- I went and confessed it to Brother Larry, and I wanted him to pray for me. And his words, he said, son, the devil can't take away what God gave you. And then, not just through his words, but through other words from other men of God, God gave me promises, and God spoke to me through his word. And so there's certain times that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Holy Spirit begins to remind me 
and what God has spoken. And the fact that I have not yet seen what God has spoken tells me that he can't take me out in between. That's the importance of you getting a word from God for you and for your family and for your life. Because when you have the word of God, you have the promises of God. And he said, so shall my word be. If you've got a word for God, there ain't no power in hell that can come and stop it. It's going to come to pass. But if you don't have nothing to anchor into, you don't have nothing to hold on to, you might believe all the different lies. I believe that I believe one of the one of the biggest things about the whole pandemic was the fear. I'm not I'm not here to argue the reality of the deal. I'm talking about, but there there was a there was a physical fear that absolutely gripped and began to choke the life out of even believers. Stop them in their tracks. And while I don't want to throw caution to the wind, there has to be a time that we read this word and say, God, I take you at what you've said. I'm not going to put my trust in science or man. I might use it from time to time. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, this is what we have to stand on. Y'all all right? So whether something lives or dies can actually be determined by what we speak to it. You see, in the beginning, I believe that that was, that was the way it worked. I believe that when Adam and Eve messed up and they lost dominion, I believe that that reality was removed from them. They lost dominion. They lost the ability to oversee, to subdue. Jesus comes back on the scene. And Jesus begins to tell people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He wasn't telling them that it's coming. He's telling them, you're looking at it. It's here. The word says that it pleased the Father that the fullness of heaven should dwell in the Son. Jesus wasn't telling them the kingdom is coming. He was talking about, he said, pray thy kingdom come. But he wasn't saying, hey, in the far distant future, the kingdom of heaven. He said, no, it's at hand. It's at hand means you can reach out and touch it. We, I hope we're in agreement with that. Jesus was the kingdom of heaven walking on earth. And he began to reinstate what the kingdom of heaven looked like. That's why he would begin to speak to things and they had to respond to the command of his voice. Don't believe me? Read your Bible. He cursed a fig tree. It died. He spoke to Peter. He walked on water. He spoke to Lazarus. Lazarus come back to life. He spoke to blind eyes. They opened. All he had to do was speak and things responded to him I believe he was showing us what it's like to live in the kingdom of God so what I'm here to tell you this morning is that I believe I'm under the conviction that you have the ability to speak into existence the promises of God for your life and if you don't believe me then that's fine you go about living the way you live in but I'm going to continue to sow words of faith I'm going, to be, I'm going to continue to frame my world with my words. I'm going to continue to build a life. I'm going to continue to build my children with the words of God, with words of affirmation. I'm going to, begin to, I'm going to continue to do the very things because right now it seems to be working pretty good. Now, I, I understand that there's sometimes we might say something and what we see is not what we say. And those times are tough. But we've got to hold fast to our what? Confession. That's what the word says. God, I might not be seeing it, but I'm going to keep saying it until I'm holding it. Has there, anybody, been ever, has there ever been anybody in here that you have continued to confess something, even though it didn't look like it, until you actually saw it come to pass? I watched, uh, I, was, I was up late one night watching one of the Christian TV channels and this young man was talking about his mom something happened she just got out of the bed one day and something happened in her spine and she she walked hunched over and and began to was in a wheelchair after that couldn't even walk no no major like no car wreck no major injuries. just something happened and it was I think it was the better part of like 12 years this young man was a spirit-filled Christian he said he prayed and believed and 
he, he said he literally, he was just about to give up hope and faith. He said, but one night, he said he prayed. He said, God, you, you said. You said. And he said, I, I began to speak the word once again. And he said that morning, he was sitting in the kitchen. And he had to, have his, he had to take care, full-time care of his mom. He said he was sitting in the kitchen. He said, and, it, and this is this guy's testimony. He said at first, he just greeted her. And then he realized she had just walked into the room. Standing upright. In a suddenly moment, God's word was fulfilled. I don't know if anybody's ever in here has ever walked into a suddenly moment where God has just, boom, caused what you've been confessing or speaking for some time to come to pass. But I believe that our words need to line up with our faith. This might, be, this might be extremely practical, but I, I really feel like if you grab this concept, if you grab a hold of this, it can change your life. If I didn't think this could change your life, I wouldn't be up here talking about it. But your words have power. If you don't believe that, then let's go back to what we said a couple weeks ago. Jesus, what he did on the cross, has already been finished for you. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, he does not find his way back to Golgotha and die a death all over again. No, he said it's done, it's paid for, it's finished. He sat down. So everything that you need or could ever want from God has already been done, completed, and purchased. So the reality of that is in the heavenlies. And the way that we pull the reality of the heavenlies into our earthly realm is to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Am, am I not right? I feel like we're struggling with that a little bit. So if that is how we obtain salvation, then it should be the same way that we obtain everything else that's a reality in the kingdom of heaven. Confessing with our mouth, confessing the word and the promises of God, believing in our heart. And like James chapter 1 verse 22, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Don't just talk the word, begin to walk the word. One thing that I, I can't stand is to hear somebody say that they're a blood-bought, spirit-filled Christian. But the only thing that ever comes out of their mouth is negativity. If the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you should be full of positive things. Your first reaction to something shouldn't be, I can't. It should be, I can. Christians, hear me, by nature, his nature, should not be pessimistic people. I'm going to say it again. Christians should not be pessimistic people. You say, some people might say, well, no, I'm a realist. I am too, but I'm realistically optimistic too. You say, well, everything's not always great. You're right. I got an enemy, and his word says that he'll prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. Well, I got this person talking about me. Blessed are you when they revile against you, when they say all kind of words against you. Oh, uh, were there... Well, they're doing this. Blessed are you when they curse you. It's what, it's what the word says. There's a way to speak positivity out of negativity. And Christians should not be pessimistic people. I'll never forget Mr. George O'Neill told dad this. <laughs> when his body was riddled with cancer, he told dad, he said, Wes, if God heals me, I win. He said, if he doesn't, I win. That confession of hope and faith in God told, told us what was on the inside of him. Either way, I win. As Christians, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Am I right? What can separate us from the love of God? There's nothing. 
So there's no reason for us to be negative. You say, well, Daryl, open your eyes. Look at the news. Watch the news. Look at what's going on in the world. And? In this world, you'll have trouble. But be of good, good cheer. He didn't say be full of turmoil and negativity, murmuring and complaining. He said, be of good cheer. Why? For I have overcome the world. Can I tell you something? That if you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've got a hope that the rest of the world may not have. It's going to be okay. Smile. Smile. I'm tired of mean Christians. If you're going to be mean, tell them you go to another church. Don't tell them you come here. <laughs> what I love about the presence of God is that God is omnipresent. He's always available. So at any time, any place, for any reason, we have the ability to pull the realities of the kingdom of heaven where we are on earth. But we're going to do it with our words. Whether we're singing them, whether we're speaking them, whether we're whispering them, or whether we're shouting them. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If somebody come to the keyboard. We should be walking around. Church, listen to me. As beacons of hope and encouragement. Every one of y'all. You, you ought to just have a loaded gun of encouragement anywhere and everywhere you go. And if you see anybody that looks like a target, just launch it on them. I'm telling you, what would the world look like if, if you, I mean, look. Now some people, they just got them faces. There ain't nothing wrong, but you just can't tell. I'm one of them. I, sometimes I'll just be in deep thought, and it might look like I'm mad at the world. I'm not mad. Just say something. It'll break me out of a trance. I, my wife does it all the time. She's like, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Well, you look angry. I'm like, I'm thinking. You don't know how much effort that takes from me. <laughs> my little girl walked up to me. One day I was, I, was, I was literally pondering something. I was sitting on the back porch, and I'm just staring off into oblivion. And I'm just, I'm thinking about something. And Andy walks up to me. She goes, Daddy, why your face like that? <laughs> I just told her, I said, baby, there's not much I can do about that. <laughs> I just, I'm doing the best with what I've been given. But you know, you can read people a lot of times just by the look on their face. You can change somebody's day. By the look on your face. Your words matter. Your actions matter. What would it look like if we, people full of the Spirit of God, walked out of this place and we took it serious? That if I see a person that I even think they're having a bad day, I'm going to grin. You might get cursed out. It's happened. I've grinned at people before and they say, don't look at me. Okay. Just, I, I've literally heard people, why are you smiling? I, I'm just happy. Well, it's making me uncomfortable. I'm, I apologize. I don't know what else to do. I'm like, no, really, stop smiling. I'm like, I, you know what? You should walk away because this is not, right now, now I'm amused and now it's really not going to, now it's just heaping coals on top of their head. But I'm telling you, the difference that we could make, do you know a smile can open a door of conversation? I, I, I'm amazed by what can change if we're just willing to have a conversation. Do you know that there's probably a lot more in common that you have with people than you think if you just talk to them? But see, that's one thing about this whole COVID thing is nobody even wants to get close to each other no more. Now, I don't try to make people uncomfortable, but I will wait. I will wait. And if I see somebody having a bad day, I, like, I'm like, it's almost stalkerish. Like, I'll just sit and wait for them as soon as they make eye contact. You're probably thinking, weirdo. 
But, you know, I've also had people ask me, why are you so happy all the time? And there's not really a great explanation for that other than there's something on the inside that's not subject to everything that's on the outside. Yeah, I can watch Fox News, but I'm not, I'm not despondent. I'm not without hope. I can, I can, I can watch the, the world news and say, oh, Lord, it's going to hell in a handbasket. But I still have this hope inside of me that it's going to be all right. And you know, it's important that I'm speaking those things into my kids as well. It's important that you sow words of life. Stop with all the negativity. Stop with all the negativity. I'm, I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you, especially you parents. Stop it. Can I, can, I just, can I just smack the parents around a little bit? Is that all right with y'all? I know school's out right now, but when you're, uh, when you're bringing your kids back to school, get off your phone in the morning. Get off your phone in the morning. What somebody else is doing on social media is not more important than your opportunity to sow words of life and strength into your little ones. Get out of somebody else's life and get into theirs. Stop letting other people put words on your family. Stop it. Listen, I'll fight you over words to my family. I've gotten in people's face before and told them, hey, bro, you can talk like that to somebody else, but that's my wife. You talk to her like that again, me and you're going to have problems. It drew a line. That's dear to me. You ain't going to talk to that any, any way you want. So why do we let the devil sit here and lie to us, tell us things? Don't let him talk to you like that. The next time he comes at you with some condemnation from your past, don't let him talk that nonsense to you. You, you spit the word back at him. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm a new creation in Christ. When the devil comes at you with all these lies, oh, you know, they, they know better. They know you used to do this and you used to do that. They know how you used to live. Don't let him talk that negativity to you. You come against that lie with the truth. Amen? Would y'all stand with me today? Listen, there is power in what we say. If they'll put Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. Jesus said, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I have stood on this very scripture and seen people have their families put back together because they declared this scripture in the face of impossibility and adversity. I have literally had men that would call me and we would read and declare this scripture over their families and we did it until their families were healed and restored. There is power in the spoken word of God. I'm about to make a strong statement and I hope it smacks you and sticks with you but God's word in your mouth is just as strong as God's word out of his mouth because it's God's word and it is alive so you speak the word of God and for all of you who've got a situation that's out of maybe out of your reach right now I want to read you this little passage Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5 because this is a question that comes, and I saved this one for last. This is a question that I get asked a lot after a context of service like this. Put it up on the screen. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only... Speak a word and my servant will be healed. Go to the next scripture if you can. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does that. 
When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. They don't have to put this on the screen, but Psalms chapter 107, verse 19 and 20 talks about the word being sent. Can I tell you the power of the word sent to a situation has the ability to change it. So before we leave here, this is a question that I get asked a lot. There may be a situation that it's, it's out of state, it's out of reach, it's out of touch. You might not feel like you can physically go do something about it. But I get asked a lot of times, what do I do about this? They, they, maybe it's a, a, a loved one on the other side of the nation that you can't, you can't reach. Dr. R.A. Torrey made a statement one time. He said, nothing is beyond the reach of prayer except that which is beyond the reach of God. You break that statement down. There's nothing beyond the reach of God. So there's nothing beyond the reach of prayer. And there is power in the word being sent. Before we leave out of this place, we're going to send the word to whatever situation. So if you need healing in your body... And you want to come, we're going to pray for you. If you need deliverance, I want you to come and we're going to pray for you. If you're believing for somebody or you need salvation, I want you to come and we're going to pray for you. And we're about to launch the word out. He said in Jeremiah, is my word not like a hammer that it breaks down walls? So I, I'm, look, listen, I'm, a, I'm a, just going to section this off. Healing, freedom, salvation. If that's you, don't hesitate one moment. If you need to be healed, come stand right here. If you need deliverance or freedom, you come stand right here. If you're believing for somebody to be saved, you come stand right here. And section by section, we're about to believe and we're about to send the word. There is power. I want all the prayer team and the elders, you guys come. Come up around these. We're going to begin to pray. Lay hands on these and pray. Come on, if you're believing for somebody, if, 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 if you may be saved, but you're believing for somebody to get saved, I want you to come right here. There is power in confession. Healing, deliverance, salvation. Come on, don't hesitate. If you need to come, come. Over here. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Come on. About to see suddenly. Father, we thank you for your word. I'm going to read this passage of scripture before we pray. I didn't put this in, in the notes, so if they don't put it on the screen, just listen to this. And I, I've read this scripture so many times, but Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. Verse 10. For as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater verse 11 you guys listen to me so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth that it shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace the word is going to come to pass, but I want to I want to reiterate the beginning of this. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Get it out of your mind that you can figure out how God's about to do what he's about to do. He's just going to do it because he's God and he can do it. So I want you to begin to pray. If you're out there, stretch your hands this way. Lord, we just declare your word that says... 
by your stripes we are healed. I want you guys to begin to confess with your mouth while you believe in your heart that by his stripes I am healed. I want you to change the context of it. Come on, declare it over yourself. By his stripes I am healed. I thank you for healing, God. I thank you for healing, Lord. I thank you that what you have done, Father, on Calvary, Lord, is being manifested in bodies right now. And Lord, we speak to bodies in the name of Jesus and we command them to be healed in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that sickness has to flee. I thank you, Lord, that disease has to flee. I thank you that you're even bringing restoration, Father, Lord, because of injury, because of damage, Lord, that you're restoring storing Lord that you're rejuvenating oh God I thank you for completion Lord I thank you that you're faithful to complete what you started healing God healing Lord Lord I thank you for healing father in the name of Jesus come on church pray with me if you pray in the spirit I want you to begin to pray father I thank you Lord we thank you for healing in Jesus name healing in Jesus name healing in Jesus name healing father I thank you for a touch we thank you for the touch. Healing, Lord. Healing, Lord. In Jesus' name, I thank you by your stripes we've been healed. We call it done. In Jesus' name. We wait to hear testimony of what you have done, Jesus. Healing, Lord. Healing, Lord. Healing, Lord. Thank you. Healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Healing, Lord. God, I thank you that you're doing a deep work. Come on, y'all stretch your hands this way. Who's, who's up here praying for freedom? Who's, is anybody? Y'all salvation? Okay. Father, I thank you for freedom in the name of Jesus. I thank you for freedom in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that at the sound and the mention of your name, every knee has to bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Sweetheart, I want you just to begin to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all in your life. And there's nothing going to hold you down anymore. Father, in the name of Jesus. You said that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Lord, so we bind up every attack of the enemy. Lord, every chain of bondage. Lord, I thank you right now that by your word, by your power, the foundations of these things are being broken. We bind it up in the name of Jesus and we lose freedom in this life. In Jesus' name. I thank you for freedom, Father, in the spirit. Is everybody up here praying for salvation or somebody to be saved? All right. Come on, I want you guys to help me pray. We're praying right now. The word says, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, that I'll draw all men unto me. We're praying for, for salvation of loved ones right now. I want you to pray as if it was your loved one that you're believing for. Come on, I want you to pray. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for every single person right now that's being represented right here. For every family member that somebody is standing in the gap for them. God, we send your word right now that they are loved, that they have been bought with a price. And Lord, we cancel the lies of the enemy and we just come against the deception and that spirit in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to send somebody with the voice of truth to them. 
And Lord, I thank you that the word is going to find them, that they have been paid for, they have been bought with a price, and that they no longer have to be uh, lost and bound to the things of this world. Father, I thank you that we are going to see prodigals come home. Those that are wayward, Lord, they're going to come back to the house of God. Lord, I thank you that there will be lives that walk into the kingdom of God because of what we are believing and confessing this day by faith. Come on, I want you to call their name out right now and just tell the devil that he has no more hold on them. Call their name out right now. And we declare, Father, that they are sons and daughters of God. We thank you for salvation. We thank you. We thank you that the gospel is going to be preached to them. And, Lord, I thank you right now that you're going to send somebody, Lord, with the spirit of truth, Lord, to sow words of grace and mercy into them. So, Lord, we thank you and we believe that we're going to see souls come into the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray that by whatever means necessary, that you would reach them. Lord, I pray even for these right now, Lord, that are up here, that you would use them as beacons of light and hope. Lord, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon them. Lord, I pray, as even as the lies that the enemy tries to come in and tell them that it ain't going to happen, Lord, that your spirit will raise up a standard in them. And we declare that it will be done in Jesus' name. We believe it because you've spoken it, Lord. And we call forth the heritage in the name of Jesus. I, I feel like just specifically before we close out, I want to pray. There, you know, there's a lot of times that parents will dedicate their children or they'll raise their kids in, 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 the, in the way that they should go. And the Bible says if you raise the children in the way they should go, when they're old, they won't depart from it. But sometimes the reality is that they're not where they should be. If you've got a child, if you've got a loved one that's not where they should be right now, but you know that they've had seeds planted in them, that the word has been planted in them, I want you to lift your hands right now. We're going to pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we don't don't care how it happens. Lord, your word says that some plant and some sow, the Holy Spirit waters, but God gives the increase. Lord, I thank you right now. We pray for every single person that there has been seeds planted and sown into them. Words, prophetic words, promises of God that they are not walking in and that they have yet to be fulfilled. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would cause these words to be watered by the power of God. Send somebody their way. Send somebody their way to speak and sow words of life into them. Until we see what you have said come to pass. Lord, we love you. We just declare today that there's none like you, Jesus. And we give you all glory and honor. We praise you, Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you. With a prophetic praise, we thank you for what is going to be done. What has been done in this house today. We thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. We thank you for salvation. We thank you that your word cannot fail us. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you're good, Lord. We thank you that you're faithful. Come on, just give him a shout of praise this morning. Lord, you're worthy. You are holy. We give you praise and glory.